So I'm Bradley Welch. Uh, welcome, glad that you all are here. And I know we've done this in most of the classes, but I, I know that most of the time we're sitting facing one person and not facing one another. So why don't we go around the room and say who you are, where you serve, and what you do there. Why don't we start with you, Mark? I'm Mark Green. I'm at First Baptist Church in Gainesville, Georgia. Been there 15 and a half years. Uh, I direct the adult choir, think, um, youth choir, high school ensemble, and the middle school handbook choir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you'll add how many years you've been wherever you are, we'll have, no, we'll have an award for the first. Uh, yeah, why don't you go out? We'll go first row in the back row. I'm Al Travis from Fort Worth. I've been at Broadway Baptist for, George, you may remember how many years? <laughs> 35. 35. 35 years. I'm the organist and the director of music ministry there. That's what I do mostly from Monday through Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm Millie Adams and I'm in Snyder, Texas, and I serve at Colonial Hill Baptist Church. I've been there 14 years. 14. I'm Lydia Bratcher and I am organist at Seventh and James Baptist Church right across the street. And I've been here for 10 and a half years, although I've been a member there for 40 something. Yes. And how many years as church pianist? Well, we kind of alternated. Ever since I was a student in the 70s, I played there, and then I became organist. Okay. She does a great job. I'm Joyce Jones, and I was I taught at Baylor for 43 years, and I've been happily retired since 2012, and so now I only play concerts. <laughs> right, I'm Jacob Silva. I'm an organist at Holy Family Catholic Church in Wharton, Texas. I accompany the Saturday evening mass, and in October I will be there four years. Four years. I'm Larry Duvall. I'm a graduate student here at Baylor. Um, I serve as organist at Calvary Baptist Church, which is where Dr. Bradley is in this room. Yeah. And I've done that for one year. One so. year? <laughs> All right. Um, I'm Bill Wyman, and I'm the choir director at First Presbyterian in Jackson, Mississippi. And I started out as organist, and then the choir director died a long time ago. And I don't even want to say how long, but it, I'm the winner. You're the winner? <laughs> well, you have to say how long. No, no. <laughs> no, 50 years. That's wow. fabulous. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Do you know Chris Brunt? I do. You know Chris is my colleague. Right. right. Yes, I do. Good to meet you. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. what, yeah, why don't we actually start back row over here? Oh, I'm Andy Rose. Um, I will be um, a freshman here at Baylor, and um, I don't have a church at the moment, but uh, I've I played services and things for a few years. I'm Jung Jin Kim. I'm an A&M United Methodist Church um, assistant music director and organist. I've been there six months. Six months. Yeah. Great. I'm Where Kelly Richardson. She said A&M. UMC. UMC. I'm Kelly Richardson. I just got here from Georgia. I'm a first year grad student in Oregon, and I'll start at McGregor United Methodist in August. Hi, uh, I'm Chuli Kim. I'm also a Baylor Oregon student, and I also start uh, First Presbyterian Church in Expo okay. from August. All right. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith, and I'm Director of Music Ministry at Church of the Messiah United Methodist in Westerville, Ohio, which is near Columbus, Ohio. And I've been there 35 years, and um, I've done all ages and all bells and all that over the years, but right now I'm and I'm still guessing about what it's going to be this fall because we're without a couple staff people. And uh, you'll hear about that in a second. And uh, um, so, yeah, adults, children, youth, uh, handbells, you know, just kind of wherever the staffing. I love to do all that, but I don't want to do all of it together at one time. So. <laughs> don't you hate it when your organist leaves you? 
Yes, especially when he's as good as Tyler. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, I'm Tyler Robertson. Uh, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I recently uh, left uh, the Church of the Messiah, the United Methodist, as organized and associate director. And I'm going to be starting at St. Mark's Episcopal in two weeks as a host. Right. Uh, I'm Keith Sandrock. I'm the organist from the East Side of the United Methodist, I'm in the East Side of the Missouri, which is south of Kansas City, southeast there. So, broad range and spectrum of experience here from half a century to haven't yet started at the church. Uh, but this is good. So, this class and the next one are going to be all about choral collaboration. Uh, how we, as the keyboard artists, can make our choirs, help our choirs be the best they can be. And there really are two parts to that. There's uh, what we can do in rehearsal, which is this class, and then the next one are the things that we can do um, during worship or during concert. Uh, and that'll focus mainly at the organ, and this class will focus mainly at the piano, since most of us have our rehearsals with the piano. How many of you um, have your choir rehearsal in a room separate from your worship space? So you. Rehearse on Wednesday nights in the choir room, and then on Sunday morning, boom, you're in the sanctuary. How many? That's the case, okay. And then how many of you rehearse in your worship space uh, each week? All right. And is that, do you rehearse in the choir room and then go down to the sanctuary to, to run through the anthem, or you just have the whole rehearsal in the worship space? Not less, but we're good, like, major works where we divide into sections. Right? Yeah. Other than that, those, yeah. That's, I ask that question because, you know, we all tend to assume that we, you know, everyone else does what we do. And um, I, I know when I uh, got my first full-time job, suddenly there was never an opportunity to run through things in the worship space until uh, right in the worship service. So that requires, hello, Hi. requires a whole different set of skills in terms of anticipation. Here are these two for you all. There's one for you, one for you, and then one each. Oh, How are you, Nancy? It's good to see you again. Do you have? Oh, I don't have that. Need one of those. Um, and let me get one more. And actually, Nancy, why don't, why don't the two of you introduce yourself? We just went around the group oh. saying where oh, we serve and how long good. we've been there. and. Um, what our name is. Okay, I'm Nancy Good, and I'm an organist uh, at Lancaster right now. We live in East Dallas. I was at Meyer Place in East Dallas for many years before it closed. My husband, Dan, is my supporter and my caretaker. <laughs> he's not a musician, so he's along for the ride. Along for the ride. He's Terrific. a great supporter. You know? We all need one, truly. <laughs> all right, so um, what I'd like to start out with is, is just some basics, but some really important things. Um, so first of all, I think be prepared. I was an Eagle Scout, I am an Eagle Scout, and that's the Scout model, so be prepared. Um, I, I always say that uh, at worst, I want to be one step ahead of the choir mm -hmm. in knowing the music, and at best, I want to be uh, few miles down the road because the more that the better that we know the music the the sooner the choir will not only just get the notes and rhythms down and put the text with it but be able to sing the nuance and expression um, so your preparation and musicality will complement in both spellings of that word your fellow musicians uh, and it encourages them to learn more quickly more musically and it makes it all a more joyful experience so, what that means is, at worst, we aim to play it correctly from the very beginning. Um, right notes, rhythms, dynamics, and style, uh, and the choir absorbs the music by osmosis. Um, one of the important things that uh, not, not all of us um, do, but I always remind myself, is that wherever the conductor is, I want to make sure that I put my music as close as possible to the sideline. So if the conductor, if uh, Jacob there is the conductor, then I want to have my music right over here. And if possible, I might even angle the piano somewhat so that I'm not having to crane my neck to see him. Um, it's, 
if, if you have a situation, how many of you have a situation where you have a video monitor where you're seeing the conductor on a Sunday morning? So everyone has a sock. How many of you even look at the conductor on Sunday morning? Okay. Actually, no one raised their hands. So. We know who runs the show. So um, how many of you have to look through a mirror to see the conductor? All right. Or, or if you're a conductor, how many of you have to see your, make eye contact with your uh, keyboards through a mirror? So if, if you do, I, my video monitor is sitting right here and the conductor is over there and I can make eye contact above the top of the, the uh, music rack at the beginning of the piece, but then for the rest of that I'm looking through uh, the video monitor. So I put my music all the way over here to the left so that it's as close as possible to that side line. Um, I have another question to add to that. How many of you have a mirror, but don't place it so that you can see the one that is directed? But, but what? But don't place it so that you can see oh. what you're supposed to see. Is this an indictment? Of no, no, this is prior <laughs> time. <laughs> I was just uh, with our chancel choir in Europe, and we sang concerts in Vienna and Prague and Budapest. And um, really, in no cases, was there an easy way to see the conductor? I, think I told everyone that there was this one place uh, where there was a mirror that was nearly directly above my head that I could only see the conductor if I leaned back far enough and I couldn't touch the keyboard. So we found an old uh, rickety wooden uh, step ladder and set it up with a broken cracked mirror duct tape to the, the ladder in order to be able to see. So that was not an ideal situation, but in any case, um, we at least want the conductor to think that we're uh, making an effort to, to stay. I have a question. Was that St. Steve, St. Um, Augustine? We did sing there in Budapest. Oh, but, but in, in Vienna? Oh, in Vienna? Augustine? No, no. We didn't sing in that room. Martin Hasselbeck was the organist there, and when I played there, the choir was a block away, and they wore <laughs> white gloves, and the, he was very tall, so the mirror was way up there, and somebody had a little Clinique mirror like this, and they scotch taped it to the person so that I could see. Right, so the conductor's <laughs> arms are about this big. Okay. Yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> Um, I think that emphasizes the need for us to be uh, telepathic, you know, when we're, uh, and in some sense I do believe that really good collaborative musicians kind of are, who sense what's about to happen. The longer you work with someone, the more you get that. Um, in, in rehearsals, I, I know especially on a Wednesday evening, it sometimes can be a challenge to stay focused. Uh, uh, and. So I always warm up vocally with the choir, even though I usually don't spend much of the choir singing. I go ahead and sing with them, do the stretching exercises and everything. Um, and I always aim to have my ear fully engaged, as engaged as the conductor is, in listening to what the choir is, is giving. Um, listen to the whole choir pitch, pitches, rhythms, so that you can make a middle note of, oh, the altos didn't get that interval. Next time we go through that, I'm going to kind of solo that out. Even before they get there, I'll start playing their parts so that they know I'm, I'm helping them with that interval that they just missed. And then listen, listen uh, to each section so that you hear altos, basses, tenors, sopranos, trying to um, see if there are any ways that you can, you can help them. Um, I, I also uh, say that whenever there's, um, whenever the pitch is sagging, you know, uh, you, you can kind of gently help that. Uh, say, for instance, we're in uh, the Majesty and Glory, I'm going to pull that out. Um, there sometimes when sopranos sing, the
but they might hear that with a gentle reminder of keeping that pitch up. Uh, same kind of thing, if the rhythm drags, you might pulse those subdivisions just like I did then, because I know our choir, at least, anytime there's a tied note or a dotted note, is late getting off the tie or the dot. So, subdivisions and help the pitch and it helps them to hear. That's a lot nicer than, um, than banging the note out. Um, know when to lay off also. Uh, there are times in, um, in learning a piece that you want to make sure that everyone is hearing all the parts and that the conductor can hear the choir without you helping too much. So what I'll sometimes do in a section um, say the next page of this piece when we get to you are mindful of him and it splits into five parts it, it might be nice to, to lay out so that we hear are those harmonies really lining up um, but then knowing when to come right back in and, and help them as needed I always like to sing along when, when I'm not playing because it helps me get a better sense of the flow of the music and it keeps me awake um, I, I also say attempt telepathy. Try to figure out what the conductor is going to fix or where the conductor is going to go next. I think probably one of the most rewarding uh, collaborations I've ever had was with uh, my predecessor, my friend David Davidson, uh, who, uh, with whom I worked at Highland Park Presbyterian and then at my current church, uh, because I remember I was subbing for two months at um, Highland Park Presbyterian. Before I was hired there, I was subbing for the organist. And uh, we had a rehearsal in the summertime and we were doing you know, a handful of anthems, I think these that we're looking at today. And I remember at one point thinking, wow, I wish he would tell the Sopranos they need to raise their soft mouth. And as soon as I thought that, he said, Sopranos, you've got to raise your soft mouth. And then after that, um, I was thinking, you know, I, I think he really needs to go back and help the tenors get that interval right. He'd go back and do that. And, he'd, and then he would stop and he'd say, okay, we're going to go back to, and I would get the pitch. And he just turned and looked at me and he said, you know, that's where I was going. So I think it's, it's kind of a fun game to play, to always be figuring out. Don't interrupt the conductor by just giving pitches, you know, while he or she is still talking. But, but play that game of, if I were leading this group, what would I be fixing? Because uh, that will help you be engaged. It'll help you be proactively anticipating uh, where you're about to go. And you can beat everyone to that spot in the music. I think another important thing um, is to use beautiful tone. Um, you know, we, we play a musical instrument, and so hopefully we play it musically. And I've heard um, accompanists, you know, when giving a pitch at the beginning of, uh, for instance, my turn of king, play for this piano. Uh, you know, this is just in rehearsal, but there's a, a beautiful way that you can give them the right kind of uh, and the right spirit, all, all just by the simple act of giving a pitch. Even if it's a forte, you can still play a beautiful forte rather than a, a harsh one. And their singing will match what you did. So another reason to um, always be thinking, how can I be helping them by modeling the most beautiful sound? I also say play the text. Um, you want to put emphasis on the important syllables and less on the less important ones. Take a look at with a voice of singing. Now, there's a way that uh, how many how many of you have ever done this? Yes, it's, a, it's a great old chestnut that many of us have used it uh, to substitute for an anthem. In the choir. I didn't quite know for some of that, so let's pull out with the voice of singing. So from the very beginning, 
I could play this two ways if the conductor said, uh, this choir doesn't know this piece, let's, let's just sing it. Uh, let's just listen to um, Bradley play it. So Bradley play the voice parts. I could play it.
as I said, that's, you know, in, in really good collaborations that I've had, that always works so well because then you're not trying to take control of the rehearsal in the rehearsal, but you're giving the conductor the benefit of your ears and saying, you know, I don't think the bass has quite made that leap right there. And, um, and so that's always a good thing to do in private. Um, and um, how many of how many of you have one of those folks in your choir? Like, yeah, yes. Nancy. Well, and also I have uh, people want to ask me directly. Would you play the alto there? What do you do then when the conductor's there? And well, you, they'll ask, will you play what? Would you play the alto part? Play the square alto part. twelve. You know, and taking the role of the leader. Right. Right. And I, I always, you know. I always kind of look to the conductor, and usually the conductor, of course, will want the albums to get to get it right. So, okay, I'd rather play this. But I, I do think that that's you know that's the the rehearsal leader's prerogative about uh -huh. what we go through and how that time is spent. Uh, so, and then the other is. Um, I think conflict resolution, you know, the, the longer you work with someone, there, there are going to be times you may have a difference of opinion about how a particular section should go or something like that. And I think it's, it's, good, to, uh, it's good to talk about those, again, outside of a rehearsal. You know, you might say in this interlude, I kind of would like to take a little bit more time. Is that workable? Um, and so then the conductor hopefully would say, well, sure, absolutely, just as long as, you know, when we get to the end of this, I'll start conducting again, and I'll pick it up. But I think having that kind of uh, healthy interaction outside of rehearsal is good. I know that, um, I know sometimes when a conductor is working with a group under pressure and say we're getting ready to walk into the sanctuary and the sopranos, are not getting this or that right, and the conductor's feeling very intense and you know, getting frustrated with the Sopranos, it can be easy uh, to unintentionally you know, snap at someone. I can, I've had that happen where a conductor says, uh, you know, I'll be playing, trying to help them play their part, and the conductor will say, will you stop so that I can fix this? And I always think, uh-oh. And it's good to you know, address those things, take a deep breath, but to address it outside and say, look, I know we were under pressure there, but you know, could, we, uh, could we have a, in front of the group a better way of, of interacting? And you know, usually that kind of makes, makes everyone, makes the conductor aware, oh yeah, I don't, I don't want to do that. That was my frustration in the moment of getting all of this ready. Um, and so I think keeping that friendly working relationship, because you are dance partners in a sense. Um, the, in the, the rest of this, we actually get into um, some of the performance aspects. And because we have a little more to cover in that than I have for uh, the, the hour a lot, I'm going to go ahead and jump into that. But I wanted to ask first, just in rehearsals, are there any things... Um, that you have ever thought, wondered, how could I help the choir more in this or that way? Or do you have any questions about anything I've already discussed? We're all, we're all helpful. I think it's a good idea where you're talking about playing deep into the piano, yeah, playing a piano like a pianist. Yeah. And not like an organist. Yes. Yeah. And one time I, I think I was in college and I somewhere to accompany a singer and uh, I think one of the faculty members at that school said uh, you're an organist are you <laughs> and that was an insult but I mean it me up to go you know I don't need to accompany these vocalists at the piano like I'm an organist and I had to think it had to do with tone and playing kind of up yeah. and finally you know over the years just you know you lean and just yeah just the tone you're using. The arm you're weight playing. and all of that. And, and having that differentiation of, you know, strong and weak, which we do on the organ, we just do it a different way than on the piano, but using those same musical elements. And I think that is something to remember that, you know, uh, most of the time, I mean, how many of you rehearse with your choir mostly at the organ? So Wednesday night rehearsals or whenever. So for all of us, it's, it's at the piano. So, 
in a way, that's really good because actually we have, um, we have the expressive means of the piano to very immediately help the choir in terms of, um, of nuance and leaning into text syllables, uh, syllables that are important. Um, and so I, I think that's a great point we, to remember that we, we are musicians first and foremost. We're pianists and organists. Uh, under that, under that title. So, being being as musical as possible is is only going to help. Yes. I, I think it's so helpful if you can get with your director at the organ before anyone else is there, yes. because there has been so much time wasted in a rehearsal with everyone there while the director says, no, I want something a little bit more so-and-so, and tries to, to get you to produce a sound that maybe the organ won't do. And, uh, and, and on the spot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and they're wasting the time of the choir. So I That's think that what you said about getting with your director yeah. at the organ so they understand that, that there's only one oboe stop, and, and if they want a clarinet, there is a clarinet. There is a clarinet, right. And, right. and that, so they know what, what is capable, yeah. of, so they don't waste time. That is a great point. And I think that what I do oftentimes, if there's a, an anthem that has uh, really involved registration or is particularly technically difficult, I'll want to run through that with the conductor you know, sometime during the week before we put that all together in the space because for that same reason. And to get feedback about, do you think this is gonna balance well? Is, you know, is this or that too loud? Because it's hard, you know, we have two Sunday morning services for which our choir sings. And if something isn't really right at the first service, it's not so easy to check it, to, to change it and make adjustments before the second one. So that's, I think that's a, great thing to get together ahead of time, uh, especially the more difficult it is, or if you're doing something major like a durable requiem or something like that. Um, because sometimes if there's a, a, an oboe called for or a trumpet called for, it may be too loud on your instrument. It may, you may have to use a different kind of sound in order to balance. So there are all of those little interchanges you might have to make, but you want to make sure that you're on the same page what can and cannot be done. Any other questions or comments? Things you've found helpful? Uh, are you directing at your church or are you playing? Sometimes. Most of the time I'm playing. Most of the time I'm playing and there's a separate conductor. Um, sometimes I do both. How many of you do both for you are? So you play and conduct at the same time. That makes it easy. <laughs> or easier. <laughs> I find having played for a long time in a company uh, in conducting, it's difficult not to be a over, overly suggestive to the organist. You know, I know how, what the organ can do and what I would like it to do, and that's yeah. a difficult kind of a balance. Yeah. To maintain. yeah. I have a colleague who uh, served at the same church for about 40 years, and uh, he knew the instrument, he was an organist himself, but he mainly conducted and knew the instrument like the back of his hand. So really for the whole repertoire that the choir sang, he had written in oh. very detailed registrations and very detailed, uh, you know, swell boxes open one quarter here and over this measure it opens to one half. And then, and so any assist, associates he ever had, you know, already have everything set for them, but there was that a little bit of tension of, okay, if I want to depart from this, is that going to be okay? Yeah. So I think that that's, you know, that's a careful, that's a, a, a tricky line to, to balance, but I think it's, it can be important because oftentimes there are things that if you know the instrument or you know the, you know the, uh, the piece well, you may be able to offer some suggestions that are, are helpful. And I tend to view everything that we do Conductor, organist, it's a one plus one equals three situation. That our collaboration builds something greater than the parts, and greater even than the sum of the parts. So um, we, 
if we all take that attitude, then we know that we're all combining our perspective for something greater than any of us can do on our own. So I think that it's, it's helpful to remember that and to form a relationship that has that as a basis so that you know that when those comments are given, they're given only in the best sense. Any other, any other comments or thoughts? So why don't we um, move to a little bit of what we do in performance and worship. And why don't we take the with the voice of singing. Uh, does everyone have a copy of that? So I think one of the most important things is to be aware of the texture. I want to make sure I don't lose my music. Be aware of uh, the texture, the dynamics, and the balance with the choir, or if you're a kind of soloist or uh, an orchestra, whatever instrument um, or forces you're, you're working with. Um, in terms of dynamics, know when you're the soloist. Uh, in the opening of With a Voice of Singing, these first two measures are organ only, so um, there's nothing stopping you from using a nice full sound, but as soon as the choir comes in, you want to get out of the way. Uh, same thing is true in, in any solos that you might be accompanying with uh, interludes, introductions. Uh, know when you're featured and then know when you're in a subordinate collaborative role. Um, it's good to know sometimes when you're in competition with the group, if there's a dialogue, the choir sings something and then you play something and then the choir sings something, that that's to be kind of an equally strong uh, dialogue and then, and then when you need to really get out of the way. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of registration in just a second. In texture, be aware of where in the texture you're playing. By that I mean, um, in, for example, in a lot of this piece, um, on the second page of it, the second full page, when you're playing Declare Ye This, you're exactly doubling the parts that the choir is singing. So what I find, if I'm playing an instrument that has a lot of really rich, wonderful eight-foot tone, that instead of piling up every single bit of rich eight-foot tone, um, with maybe a four-foot, level, but you have a little bit of forefoot sound an octave higher so that they can hear and so that it adds a little brilliance to the texture. Some of us don't have the luxury of having an organ that has a lot of eight-foot tone, and if that's the case, you don't need to worry about this, but I think it's still good to be aware of that. Um, how many of you know Mac Wilberg's anthem, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling? Um, a lot of Mac's uh, anthems are orchestrated for uh, the Temple Square Orchestra to play with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. So then his accompaniments, what you play when you accompany these, are reductions of that orchestration. So it, your hands will be full of, full of notes, often right in that same range where the choir is singing. Now, um, what I tend to find in a lot of those, and in fact, in most of that anthem, I end up using very little eight-foot tone. I mean, maybe a string and a flute, with four foot principle, two foot principle, because the texture is so thick, I don't want to compete with the voice parts that are singing in that same area. So uh, there's a time to pile up eight foot tone when you're playing by yourself and you want a nice big rich sound, but then when the choir comes in, you can thin that out. Uh, and I'll often do that. You know, if I'm playing here at the beginning with the voice of singing, not only are those first two measures going to be louder, but they're also going to be full with a lot of rich eight-foot tone. But then when I go to the positive manual or the swell, when the bar comes in, it may be eight-foot string, eight-foot flute, four-foot principal mixture, oboe, that kind of thing. 
rather than a lot of piled up eight foot tone. Um, and then I think that perhaps one of the most important things is reality. Knowing how your instrument and how your choir sound together out in the room. Um, most of us are in a situation where our organ is not situated in the most ideal place to determine how things are sounding. So it's helpful to, to figure out what is your benchmark for what balances with the choir. I know at my church I've discovered when the choir is singing, if I can just barely hear myself above them, then the balance is right. And that's true at every dynamic level. If, I, if they're singing here and I can just barely hear myself, then that's right. If I can hear myself well, I'm too loud if they're singing. Uh, if I can't hear myself at all, then it's a little bit too soft. But I've discovered that by uh, having someone else play and me go out in the room and listen. Uh, if you have the luxury of moving your choir downstairs on a Wednesday night and you have the luxury of maybe having a colleague or a friend go over and play the instrument, then you could go and hear what that sounds like using your own registrations and everything. Um, then you get, it's, it's really uh, an epiphany to find out how things sound out in your own room, quite a bit different than when you're sitting there at the, at the console. Um, Consider the color and the mood of the text or the texture when you're choosing registration. Um, now, granted, some of us play very small instruments, and you may have only a couple of choices that are going to balance with the choir. And if that's the case, you have to balance with the choir. Um, the, but most of us have that opportunity with larger instruments, even, even uh, modest-sized ones, um, to use different kinds of tone. Maybe you want uh, a nice string celeste kind of sound. Maybe you want a fluty sound. Maybe you want uh, a rich, dark, 16 and 8 foot uh, diapason uh, sound. Maybe you want um, reeds for something. Um, all of these can be in the same way that we unpack the text of hymns and we choose registrations accordingly. You can do the same thing in anthems. Um, there's a little spot in My Eternal King, and I'll play all the way through this in a little bit, but if you'll take My Eternal King, um, when we sing on, you may have different page numbers. On page five, you all have at the top of page five, must die eternally. You have that. It's the third full page of this. Um, you know, I could easily play, hold on, that's not right. Oh, we're on a guest level. One second. Um, so does everyone see where that is? Mm -hmm. Um, so I could easily just play that on, um, you know, it, it's soft, so I could play that on this eight foot flute here. And that would balance, and there'd be nothing wrong with that. But I could also play it with this Gims Horn 8 and 16 foot board, so it's very dark and full boating with 32 foot in the pedal. Moving a little bit further along, there's this part on page 9. O oh, blessed Jesus Christ, should I not love thee well, not for the hope of winning heaven, sound that kind of would paint the picture of hell, something that's reedy and snarly, kind of ugly sounding. So you can hopefully on your instrument find some sounds that, that would do that. If, if I didn't have a wahuman or a, or a small crumb horn that I could get soft enough, you could just take your, your 
eight foot string in the swell and maybe subcouple it. Or maybe 16, 8, and 4. Something that captures that if you have an oboe. <coughs> right. So finding a, a sound that um, is colorful, that, that really captures that. Lots of other opportunities um, to to do some of these, I'll show you in The Majesty and Glory. Finding places where you can paint the picture of light, uh, where, where that's appropriate. Um, when accompanying a solo voice or a solo instrument, it's really probably best to um, stay away from mixture tone, unless maybe you're playing for uh, brass, it's for, because um, most of the time that, um, that mixture tone is confusing to the harmonics of an oboe, for example, or of a flute. Um, now, that's not to say that it would never work, but just be aware of that, that we as organists get used to the brilliance and of, of a mixture sitting on top of an ensemble, but if you're accompanying a woodwind instrument that has a really, um, a really rich harmonic makeup, like an oboe, um, or a flute, or a bassoon, uh, that we want to be able to support that uh, so that the beauty of that full spectrum of tone is, is still present with, without the organ tangling with that. Um, let's see. I think some of the rest of these, we can actually just observe real time. In music. So why don't we look at, with the voice of singing, and I'm going to just play a bit of this um, and talk you through my, my thinking, how I register this. So I start this out um, on the break with nice, big, full sound, lots of uh, articulate, excuse me, lots of articulation with um, great full up to mixture, and then the swell has uh, full up to read, no mixture, and coupled down to the positive. So here the swell and positive are enclosed, great, of course, is unenclosed. So the opening I'll play on the great, and then right away go to the positive. <laughs> predominant again, but then coming right back down to the positive after that. Um, let's do right on earth, so... So notice right there, as the choir finished its last that I went to, um, I went to the great for that little three beat uh, section. So as they're finishing that, so let's do the hallelujahs right at the top of that page, starting with the sopranos and I 
I wanted to show you here. As the choir finishes, my left hand comes up on the uh, fourth beat and then the downbeat of uh, that, that measure when the choir drops out, both hands come up. So uh, here's one other thing that I, I kind of like that gives sustained but gives also rhythm. In this little horn fifths, I play the, the left hand fairly legato. playing more legato, we get so you get that rhythmic texture but sustained in the left hand when combined with the little timpani uh, in the pedal. And I go ahead and just add some extra pedal there. Um, I don't think that there's anything holding you to playing the E up the octave. You can play down and then even add a fifth if you like. So then, O oh, be joyful to in God all ye lands. Because the choir is only singing mezzo forte here, I bring the manuals back a fair amount. Uh, but the pedal still needs to be a little bit stronger, so I still have the great couple to it, even though I'm playing on the positive and swell. So here one more time, and here you could play, or you could do our same trick of left hand legato, right hand accented. Here I'm using just string and flute so that that's a bit softer. Um, then this next section, um, the way that I set up the organ um, is to have all of my divisionals on the swell and the great be in a buildup. So I start with an eight foot flute. Here we have an eight foot string on the great. divisionals on our instrument but I think still you can set you can set things up in a crescendo so that you have that ability to do what I'm about to do here where we just left off so what I did was I was pressing swell divisionals as I closed the swell down so one more time I could do the same thing. 
thing with the grade. Say, say maybe I, I have a lot of um, uh, grade stops. You know, there's the beginning of the uh, far a requiem. It's you start out with a um, fairly full sound, and you could make the whole diminuendo happen. Everyone knows how the far a requiem opens with a big D unison. So you can make that big diminuendo happen just by using all these divisionals. I do great seven six five four three two one swell seven five seven six five four three two one. So that gives you that ability to traverse those uh, dynamics fairly evenly. As soon as the choir comes in at the top of the last page, I sneak down to the positive and then gradually build back up. So here, let's walk through this. left you can load up everything in your enclosed divisions <laughs> so just makes it, to me, a little bit more interesting because you've got this constant motion. Um, I remember, how many of you have ever heard the Sassan organ symphony? Uh, so, you know, the ending of that is very exciting um, because the organ's playing, you know, this big uh, C major, lots of C major, that fabulous C major descending scale at the very end. Um, I remember when I heard this well, there, there's that spot where the organ's playing a big C major chord, orchestra is playing also, uh, orchestra cuts off, and it's only organ holding the chord and the timpani are going boom, 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 And then the orchestra comes in again on that big C major chord. Well, if the organ is playing, you know, full out everything the whole time, going <laughs> You can see the tympanist up there moving, but you can't necessarily hear it. So, one thing that um, I have heard before is you have everything on in, in your enclosed divisions, and which is still, you know, nice and big and full. So the tympanist is playing bum, 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 and then you can start using your great divisionals to crescendo as you're opening the box. all the way leading up to the point that the, that the uh, conductor brings the orchestra back in. So you can do those kinds of things using both your swell boxes as well as if you have those pistons set up in a crescendo. And I think